All right, we should start. Uh, we have this much anticipated talk from Mao Yoshida. And uh, Nathaniel has been uh, mentioning now many times during his talks. And uh, please, now. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my pleasure to be here. Uh, this is my first time to come to uh, Beijing. I've been to Shanghai several times, but uh, uh, before pandemic, I was able to come to China without visa, uh, so I was very careful. Then, but finally, I was able to make it, so I'm very glad to be here. So uh, I think you might have heard a lot about the important learning already. And uh, some of the basics uh, you might know. Uh, but I, I want to uh, make sure that everyone understands some of the basics. So uh, I, I, there might be some repetition of them uh, to, from the previous lectures. Please bear with me. So uh, usually, I, I, I think I, I have given back to back lectures uh, with Nathaniel many times in different uh, summer schools, actually. And usually, I present first and then do some basics. <laughs> Then Nathaniel uh, elaborate more on model base and stuff. So, but uh, the, the, the order change. Uh, but anyway, so let, let's get started. Uh, so please feel free to interrupt me uh, anytime. So you, you've already learned uh, the enforcement learning. So just to um, get some uh, in interaction. So what what really defines the enforcement learning as opposed as opposed to supervised learning or some other algorithms? What are the kind of the features or what defines the enforcement learning? Can, can anyone say? Sparse reward. Sparse reward, yes. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. There is no feature that you what is correct. Yeah. So the, the in supervised learning, you get correct answer and then get, uh, try to be uh, closer to that uh, correct answer. But in enforcement learning, there's no correct answer. And the nature of the task is you get some scalar reward signals and then you want to maximize. So, for example, if I give you, uh, let's say, uh, uh, so, Forgive me using US dollars, but if I give you one thousand dollars, you might be some, uh, be happy. But also, if that turns out to be your one month salary, you get the, uh, offended, right? So I think depending on the context, of your expectation, the same reward might mean different. So that that skip, so the reward signal has that property that if you're not given the correct answer of what is good or what is bad. Uh, so you have to then maximize uh, that uh, quantity. So that, that's a unique feature. And because of that, uh, there are some interesting uh, problems uh, associated with that. So this is a kind of a slide that uh, Michael Dominic presented in one of the summer schools. So uh, the reinforcement learning is not defined by particular algorithms, indeed. And enforcement learning algorithms often use 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 um, deep learning networks, convolutional neural networks, to compute action value uh, and policy and so on. So, uh, and backpropagation is often used as well. So the algorithms don't necessarily define what the enforcement learning is. The nature of the problem defines the enforcement learning. And so, because of that, you have to discover solutions that the teacher doesn't give a solution. And because of that, you have to explore different uh, possibilities and then find out uh, what is good, what works, and what doesn't. And uh, the sparse, sparsity of the reward that was pointed out, and it's related to the nature of reinforcement learning where reward is often delayed. After taking multiple actions, uh, you get some sparse reward signal. And then you have to optimize it. So uh, the, this delayed nature of reward really poses uh, interesting problems or difficulties in the enforcement learning. So how can this be solved is an interesting issue, important issue. And um, 
over the last 10 years or so, there has been uh, also a development in artificial intelligence. Now, uh, very difficult problems can be uh, uh, solved by uh, reinforcement learning or in AI, and I should not just say AI. And uh, these examples, uh, such as uh, playing Atari game, uh, video games, or playing Go uh, or chess, Starcraft, so these, these um, uh, algorithms are developed using uh, reinforcement learning uh, algorithms. And these, these examples highlight uh, particular examples uh, using deep reinforcement learning, which is the combination of deep learning and reinforcement learning. And it's also important to realize that many of these examples actually use uh, the temporal difference learning algorithms. So, um, so this algorithm uh, I'm going to talk about, temporal difference learning algorithm, remains to be a very powerful algorithm, even in recent AI applications. And uh, you might have seen this slide multiple times, but uh, uh, so, so, so you, you have seen this and you understand this, right? Or is that okay? Should I go over? Maybe not. <laughs> so, okay, well, please respond. <laughs> so, uh, this is a famous experiment done by Walter and Schultz. And um, I'm going to explain how TD era, TD learning, explains this uh, uh, activity of those neurons. So, so, so I'm, I'm going to give some introduction to, to that. So, so uh, the point here is that the finding of this dopamine neuron activity really connected uh, neurobiology with the uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. Um, so today I'm gonna, so in this lecture, I'm gonna talk about um, basics of uh, temporal difference learning, and then uh, uh, present uh, some of the recent work uh, pointing uh, some uh, essential property of uh, temporal difference errors uh, observed in dopamine signals. So you might have discussed some random signals with Nathaniel, so that, that's what I'm gonna talk about. So, to understand what TD learning is, uh, I'm going to present some examples. So this is a demonstration of how TD learning solves a very simple problem. Uh, so there's a rat, and there's a maze, and there's a cheese. So the rat's uh, job is to find the shortest path to the reward. And to set up a reinforcement learning uh, framework, you have to define some reward function. And uh, in this case, reaching to the goal results in uh, plus 20 points. And uh, to encourage short, taking a shortest path, uh, you could, for example, give a uh, cost of each step. This could be a small, a negative uh, reward. Uh, so after saying this, uh, you can see how uh, rapid uh, burns. Um, so rat is moving around, and then uh, the yellow indicates the value of uh, each location. And then as the rat moves around, the color of the uh, location change, different locations change. And please pay attention when the color changes as the rat moves. So I'm going to define what value is, but value is roughly how good each location is. And after learning this landscape of value, then rat can see, uh, predict the path leading to higher and higher value uh, is, is a good path. Right? So one way to solve this kind of maze is to learn this value function across the different locations. Yep. So what do you see as for it? Epsilon really, or any other form of randomization? Uh, so in, in this case, I'm using just Ipsilon really. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Um, it may not be the optimal way to solve this problem, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So this, this is just to uh, illustrate a simple point, uh, how TD works. So uh, I'm, I'm going to play the... Uh, 
So I, I understand that this is a mixture of uh, some virus and maybe expert, expert of um, Yeah. So I just wonder why some kind of agent that is stuck. Yeah. So um, first of all, the, the question that I asked uh, when when the color changes. Uh, the color changes only locally around the, the route, right? So if you pay attention closely, the color changes. So when the, the rat moves from one location to the other, uh, the color of the previous location is changing. Right? And then there's some uh, random movement uh, that happens. That, that is related to the previous question of exhibition greedy. The, the way this is run right now is uh, Thirty percent of the time, uh, just randomly choose that, 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 the location to go, and then seventy percent of the time, uh, it's going going to the best location around a uh, given time. Right? So uh, let's unpack a little bit more precisely about how this learning happens. So uh, after moving from this location to that location. Uh, so the, there's a value associated with t plus one and value of t. And you compute this difference between uh, real t plus one and real t, uh, multiplied by gamma. I, I, I will come back to this uh, later. But basically, it's checking whether the value increased or decreased, okay. and then uh, whether the reward came out. And after detecting the change in value, then the the value of the previous location is updated right here. Right. So that, that's all of what this is doing. Uh, and update happens by uh, uh, calibrating TD error and multiplied by this learning rate parameter alpha. So just a small fraction of delta uh, is added to the, the old value, and that becomes the new value. Right. So that's how this. Uh, uh, Algorithm uh, was what uh, was run, running. Yeah. So what is the v is the value at which spatial coordinate? Um, so, but v of t is value of this location. Okay. So v of t can uh, can be depends on the path. Uh, it doesn't. So. Uh, it's 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 so called Markov property. So uh, no, but I mean it depends. So you only have t as a variable. So you've just sort of you don't have v i uh, t. Okay. So, so more precisely, this should be uh, value is the function of the states, the state at t and state at t plus one. Right. Okay. So uh, yeah. yeah. It's updating the pattern value, or is it updating I guess, the uh, the value of the location? Value of the location. But I, I guess that's uh, there. There is a, a distinction between the external, uh, you know, external world, the lo the value of the location was their own action by turning left, uh -huh. and right, or, or yeah. yeah. So this in, in this case. Uh, uh, we are not using any action value, so this is just a uh, value of the location uh, in, in this example. But in the brain, the coding for for back, no, value outside of uh, in, in the internal world versus the value of action can be very different. Yeah, yeah. that's right. In terms of neural coding. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna uh, use action value slide briefly uh, in later slides. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I didn't define any of these terms. So now let's uh, define some terms. So uh, the, there are three key components in the enforcement learning. One is state and value function and policy. The state in this case is the state corresponds to each location. And the value function in this case, the value is uh, uh, the function of the state. So that each location gets state. Uh, and value is defined by the sum of all the future reward starting from the current state, current location in this case. Uh, but 
to, to um, emphasize more recent work as opposed to far, far in the future, there is a discount factor that is multiplied uh, to uh, discount the future world. So uh, the value function is defined by uh, the sum of all future rewards, but with future rewards uh, discounted by this factor gamma. Gamma is uh, uh, a factor between zero and one. And the policy is uh, the rule that defines how to say an action uh, in a given state. So, um, so the policy that we, discuss, we have here is called epsilon greedy uh, policy. So in, in some fraction of the trials, you flip the coin, and then in other cases, I just choose the best action. Just to clarify for the students, because they have seen a, maybe a different notation, and then back to Rob as a point. So the value function is a specific state, right? It's not a specific time, so it's right. V of S of T. Yeah. And then there is a missing expectation in the sound, right? Because, uh, yeah. because, yeah. because the policy is, uh, is partially stochastic, yeah. and the value depends on the policy. Yeah. 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 And, and for this case, are you interested in the policy, in the epsilon policy, uh, in the epsilon policy, or in the optimal policy? So are you interested in? I guess because the value so, of each is different. Yeah. So I, I'm not really doing uh, this in a mathematically rigorous way. But please forgive me. I think I'm trying to keep very the, the intuitive uh, understanding of uh, of, of this. Right? Um, yeah. So we, we can uh, talk about that more, but. Yeah. But are you interested in the, in the value of the, under the epsilon PD policy or the value of the optimal policy? What are you interested in? I'm, I'm trying to give more general uh, okay. way of uh, looking at this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so, yeah. yeah. So, the, the value function is defined by some of all future rewards, as he said. Uh, this, is, this is the expectation, but to, to present this in an intuitive way, I'm omitting that, right? Um, and if you look at this uh, equation, uh, you realize that this part of the equation is uh, gamma v of t plus 1. So, um, Ideally, uh, this uh, relationship should hold. Um, v of t is, is going to be equal to r of t plus gamma v of t plus 1 on average. But so then, if you take the difference between the left hand side and right hand side, uh, this, uh, uh, so now just having uh, this right hand side minus left hand side, right? And this is the definition of temporal difference error. Uh, so this means that after uh, you learn uh, the value functions, uh, the t error should be minimized to zero. But uh, if this uh, the line is not uh, good, then uh, these two terms might not be equal. So this gives um, the um, this gives you how bad your value function is in a given moment. And then this is the prediction error signal. Uh, and it's called temporal difference error because it uh, com computes the, uh, the value at time t and value of t plus 1. After taking one action, you get uh, the reward uh, and you add uh, v of t plus 1. So, this, so uh, the reward that you just received plus v of t plus 1 defines the value uh, of t, state t. Uh, so, uh, so this uh, using this uh, uh, TD error, you update the value to, um, to to the new value. Okay. So, um, the temporal difference learning uh, turns out to be uh, quite powerful, as as we can see in many recent examples. Uh, the the re one of the reasons why TD learning is powerful is the following. So, as we discussed earlier, um, the reward is often delayed. So, after taking multiple actions, you may or may not get reward. Um, uh, so, the challenge here is reward comes only after a sequence of actions. So, 
Uh, it, it is often unclear which actions were responsible for obtaining reward. And this is called temporal credit assignment program. Uh, this is generally a very difficult program. But how TD learning or well, its variant, uh, so now I'm talking about action value. Uh, uh, so so you, you can define how good different actions are, so going up or uh, left or right, down, uh, on a given moment, a given state, from the given state. Uh, so, let, um, so after taking this action, for example, you want to increase or decrease uh, the action value amount. You can, so after you, you have this uh, value function associated with different uh, locations, the, the value function is still something that you're learning, but you can use tentatively, at least tentatively, use value function to judge whether your situation got better or worse, right? So in this case, uh, given this value function, the taking the upward movement increased your state value. So this tentatively tell, tells the agent that this action was actually good. So you can positively update this action value. As opposed to when you take this action, moving to the left here, the value function decreased. So you can tentatively punish uh, this action. So in addition to uh, state values, you can learn these action values. Uh, and you can use these state values to tentatively uh, uh, judge uh, whether the given action is good or bad. And then uh, update action values. Uh, in addition to updating state values. So you are kind of bootstrapping uh, the, uh, the, the process. And eventually, if you pick, if you pick enough, um, the, both action values and state values can converge to the optimal value function. So um, the, using the state values, uh, you can uh, solve the temporal credit assignment program. So namely, even before receiving reward, actual reward, you can use how this, how this prediction chain uh, to update or learn uh, the action values. Right. So, so that's how, how uh, this TD learning uh, uh, solves a uh, temporal credit assignment problem. Any questions so far or any clarification uh, you have? So the one, one key aspect of TV learning is really computing error signals uh, as you go, uh, as you move along, right? Even before receiving the actual reward, you compute TV error and update your state value to action values. That's the key to temporal difference learning. Okay, so the TV learning, uh, so, so far I have been talking about uh, this tabular, tabular method, meaning that uh, different locations, different states uh, have uh, each uh, different values. Uh, but uh, when the state space is very big, like solving uh, actual uh, complex games, uh, this method doesn't work because the number of states uh, 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 becomes huge. Uh, so the common approach is to use this, uh, some neural networks to replace this one-to-one -one correspondence. Uh, in this case, the state input uh, is put into the network in the compute value or policy. Uh, the idea is if the states are similar enough, they, they, they should generalize, right? So you don't have to really learn each individual state. And you can use this network to generalize similar states. Uh, and compute a value in points. And this method was actually used to uh, so, uh, to play a backgammon back in 1980s, I think. Okay, so, uh, so do, you, do you know backgammon? Okay, uh, yeah. So some, this is popular in uh, Western countries. Well, Western from the point of view of Japan or <laughs> China. But, uh, anyway, so uh, 
Yeah, so this is a fairly complex game. Uh, original, uh, the, before TD learning, it was very difficult to play uh, with computers like uh, art. Uh, but TD learning was able to do it. Um, and one of the reasons is, is using uh, the, uh, the network. And then um, um, another uh, key point is uh, this TD learning uh, can be set up to be local. So in, in the in the previous example, just once uh, remembering uh, the current state and the next state, T state of T and state of T plus one, and then update. So you don't really have to remember the old histories coming to that point. So the learning can happen in you know, a very local uh, with, with local information, and that. Uh, was very really important to save the memory uh, demand of these, uh, these uh, learning. So even when the computer was very slow compared to the current computers, they were able to play uh, backgammon at human or uh, human expert level. Okay. And more recently, the similar method was used uh, in uh, in more uh, complex games. Uh, so this is a landmark paper, paper by uh, DeepMind. Um, so this uh, used a convolutional neural network to compute action value. So in this case, uh, the moving the lever up, down, or left, right. So there are um, or pushing button and all these combinations. Um, so the state in this case is pixel image uh, of the game. And then you just put these into the original neural network and then compute action values. Um, and then the loss function uh, that was minimized was uh, something like TD error. So in, in, in this case, uh, so this is called uh, QQ stands for action value. And then taking max, uh, uh, it, this, this is a method uh, called uh, Q learning. And in any case, this is uh, quite similar to the TD era that we have been discussing. Using stochastic uh, gradient descent, they uh, uh, tuned the shunted, uh, uh, the weights uh, between neurons, and that was able to play uh, backgammon with some other tricks. Okay. So, so these are uh, kind of very um, intuitive uh, 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 introduction to TV learning. Do you have any questions or comments? So, so everyone understood the basics of TV learning. Yeah? What is this function, function approximation? Is there a more systematic way to do it than just train the network? Um, a more principled way to think about it? Principled ways. Um, like you want some kind of course grading, I guess. Um, Is there some, some, uh, so, are there simple examples, for example, where you could do it and then you have some analytic setup to do it? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know about that. So, um, you could start from random network and then usually they uh, have computers play with each other, right? But also, you can pre-train the network using uh, actual performance of the expert. For example, uh, you can use uh, expert uh, playing goal, and then that uh, action, state action mapping uh, could be uh, in the database, right? So uh, you can use that database to train uh, pre-train the uh, network. That, that's actually done uh, in AlphaGo. Uh, and then after training uh, the policy network, you can then uh, uh, learn value function and self-play, and then it, uh, it, it, yeah, elaborate more. So, but I'm, I'm not aware of uh, having some structures or pre-structures. Pre, uh, but I'm not the expert of AI, so there might be something. Okay. So, okay, so uh, what's interesting about TD learning um, for us biologists uh, is that 
um, not only explain this dopamine response, but also we can think of some uh, correspondence to circuit-like structure. So what's interesting about the e-learning is it's normative. I it can get all optimal body function and policy, but also uh, it has some mechanistic insights directly. So the simple model is, for example, so this is the model proposed uh, used by uh, Schultz, uh, Diane, and Montague. It's a fam famous paper. Uh, you, you could have some, imagine this is a neuron, and then respond to a stimulus. And then uh, another neuron is activated after some delay, and then you have some sequence of activation across a uh, population of neurons. And then this, these new neural activities converge on the, uh, this value unit. So this the unit, this neuron computes value. Uh, and then uh, this is used to compute the error. So basically, the, the value is computed as the weighted sum of these activities. Okay. Uh, so, so this is shown here. And um, using this uh, update rule, so this is uh, learning, so the, the shunty weight here is updated by this uh, update rule. Um, so the alpha is learning rate parameter and the activity of uh, these inputs. So this could be uh, one or zero. So basically, uh, as soon as the stimulus is presented, this neuron uh, activity gets one, uh, and then this is uh, used to compute value. Right. So, so this is the activity, and then uh, the TD error. So by using uh, this update rule, uh, uh, this, this uh, network uh, learns uh, the, the value. Uh, OK. So uh, to, uh, and, and this could be a rapid map to the cortex, striatum, and dopamine you know, in the brain. So this is uh, at least I'm studying a model of how to think about uh, neural circuits implementing uh, uh, this type of model. Okay, so how can we explain uh, do uh, dopamine response uh, by Shukyo? Yeah. Sorry, just for this slide, could you maybe, is it possible to summarize what the uh, dopamine response is? Because it's a yeah. combination, combination sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, the uh, this is basically a state, uh, so the, what the state of the world is, uh, and so it's receiving some stimulus and then activate uh, neurons in, in sequence. Uh, yeah, I will come back to uh, how more complex uh, neural networks, like the current neural network, could uh, be doing this. But this is the simplest case, right? And summarizing what's happening in the world. So some event happens, and then uh, you have a sequence of activation uh, driven by that stimulus. And then you can think of these sequence of activations, a uh, different set of neurons representing different stimuli. At, the, at least that's how it, uh, this model could be set up. Yeah. And then using these activities, uh, the sprite of neuron, medium spinal neurons compute uh, the, the body. And then synaptic weights are updated based on this learning uh, rule are using the uh, the TDR. It's computed based on the reward and the value that you just computed. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, as I said, the TD learning, so these models are both normative and also mechanistic and gives some starting model to think about how the brain may be implementing this. So let's apply this to uh, uh, the classical conditioning paradigm that the uh, shoots and colleagues used. Right? So uh, instead of two, two dimensional maze, you can think of the states being uh, one dimensional uh, the, the state. Um, so it's corresponding to different time, time step from the queue um, and uh, the, uh, the reward. So this is often called complete serial compound or top delay line. And uh, so uh, as you saw in the main example, the value would propagate backward uh, from 
the reward to the earlier and earlier time, uh, earlier states, in this case time. Uh, and then the TD error happens when the value increases or decreases. So the TD error will gradually move forward, so, which is shown here. So the value function, uh, so TD error happens, and then value is updated. Um, and then because of that value moves uh, forward, and then TD error also moves forward, right? Yeah. Can you tell us something about the resolution? So, um, yeah, we define, in the model we define particular uh, uh, DP, so time step, but in the brain it's unclear what, uh, what is the right uh, time scale is, or whether we, we can think of activity in a very discrete manner. That, that's not very clear. So that's why we are now using more uh, recurrent neural networks to look at how things might happen. And I will come, come back to that uh, later. Yeah. So these settings are very sim simplistic, but at least uh, can start explaining dopamine response. So uh, after uh, the value function, com uh, so after animal one, the association between Q and reward, you saw this value function developing in this form. Uh, and the V of T plus one uh, is just one time step shifted value of a V of T. So if you compute uh, this, this part of the equation, uh, gamma V of T, T plus one minus V of T, you get transient increase when the Q is presented and transient decrease when the time passes beyond the time of expected reward. And so after passing, after time passes beyond this, time, this point, the monkey doesn't know when the next reward is going to come, so the value function will go down. And uh, the, this part of the equation is the transient increase and decrease. And when reward comes, then these two cancel, cancel out, and therefore, uh, you get a uh, uh, flood response here. So uh, with, with this TD learning model, uh, just a very simple TD equation, now you can explain dopamine response by combining these three terms. Uh, the Q response that uh, uh, happens uh, when uh, uh, Q predicts reward, and the reward response is greatly diminished because these two cancel out. And when reward is omitted, reward actually didn't come, so there's no positive uh, input, then you get deep in the activity. So uh, just simple learning will propagate in value earlier and earlier, and then uh, stops here, uh, and then get this shape of value function. And uh, now you can explain uh, the TD, uh, so dopamine response using TD uh, error. Any questions so far? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, so this this uh, model has been quite influential, but for a long time there was a puzzle in the field, which is that the whole idea of this simple model is that the value gradually propagates earlier and earlier to link the prediction uh, at the Q. To the, to the later rewards, right? Um, and as a, as a consequence, uh, the TD error should be propagating backward uh, in time from the time of reward to the time of Q. And this is the actual figure in the original paper uh, by Schultz, Diane, Monte. But it, it was very difficult to observe this gradual shift. And many people argue that because, of, because we cannot see these uh, gradual shift, and uh, maybe TD learning is not uh, what's happening in the brain. But with the advent of um, modern techniques like uh, dopamine sensors, calcium sensors, we got a much better sensitivity, and we were able to demonstrate that at least in some conditions, this gradual shift uh, happens. Right? So this is a classical condition uh, associating all the olfactory cue to the reward. Uh, this is a head fixed mouse, uh, and we present all the path to the, to the nose and present water from the water spout. Um, 
And in this particular experiment, we use a calcium sensor expressed in the do in dopamine neurons. And we are measuring fluorescent signals from axons in the nucleus akimba, so ventral striatum, where uh, we typically find reward prediction error signals. And what's shown here is the reward comes here. At the, at the beginning, uh, there's not much response, and then mostly it responds only to reward. But gradually, we start to see some uh, uh, activation um, before uh, reward, and this gradually moves uh, earlier and earlier, and uh, reaches to the Q timing. Yeah. But here it looks like it's a mixture of reward prediction error and reward. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because you still have some peak. Yeah, so this is what typically happens. So the reward response do not necessarily, does not necessarily completely uh, disappear. And one potential reason is temporal uncertainty. So as the time elapses, uh, the animal has, uh, there is some uncertainty about when exactly what happens. So that might be contributing, but uh, yeah, there, there could be other reasons. So it was difficult, as I said, it was very difficult to uh, detect these uh, gradual shifts. And, and uh, maybe some people try to do that by single neuron recording by electrophysiology. But uh, these experiments typically require averaging multiple neurons or multiple trials. And during learning, you, you cannot uh, average across trials. So if, if you average animals, then uh, the problem is that different mice, different animals have different speed of learning. So some animals quickly learn, uh, like this one, but some animals very slowly learn. So if you average the different animals uh, learning with different pace, then you might not be able to effectively average uh, and see the, the signal. So in any case, at least in some conditions, not always, but we can see uh, this gradual shift. And this is not a very trivial phenomenon to observe. Uh, and uh, we think that this is a good evidence supporting TD learning -like mechanism. Uh, and I believe that Nathaniel might have also presented some dopamine signals propagating in a spatial learning task. So it's not just this classical conditioning paradigm, but more interesting spatial learning. You can also see this gradual shift. Right? Okay. Any questions? A lot of variability, especially in the modified plot. Yeah. I'm curious if you think that's all due to the uncertainty of the reward timing, because the reward, uh -huh. right? Correctly, I think it's only a few seconds, right? So yeah. it shouldn't be significant. Um, I mean, like uncertainty relative to the life of the animals. Yeah. Or even to the day. So I'm curious whether or not you think that's just noise in the system or um, makes the processing something else, or what you think um, we're explaining that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is. For us, still an early phase of learning. So we typically train mice over uh, a week or so. Uh, this is maybe um, three days. Uh, so this can get smaller, but uh, not always. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but, but we don't know exactly uh, why that's the case. Yeah. yeah. Not reported until like two years ago. Yeah. What was the difficulty? Yeah, so if you so the major technique, so so now you are very lucky that there are so many techniques to measure dopamine neurons, but until like five years or so uh, five years ago, uh, there are only a few groups that, that were able to record dopamine neurons reliably. And then now with new techniques, uh, the people who are characterizing dopamine response just explode it. Uh, so first, it's, uh, the detectability is one. So if you're recording single neurons one by one, it's very difficult to see these. So, so in the model, this is not necessarily a big signal, right? So, so that's a starting point. And then to detect that uh, with variability across animals, it was very difficult. So it's, and also, 
This is a temporary smear but uh, activity. It's not a sharp response. And picking these slow signals is actually uh, easier with slow measurement because the slow measurement integrates over, over time. So you can actually more reliably average uh, across time and then be able to pick up these responses. The slowness is another factor. Uh, the slowness of the new measurement method also is suitable for picking up these, uh, these signals. No. Any other questions? All right, so, yeah, so um, there has been uh, a lot of uh, success in this TV learning uh, uh, um, algorithms, but uh, there have been challenges, um, many challenges uh, these days. And I'm going to talk about ramping uh, dopamine today uh, in this lecture. So uh, many people now have observed that dopamine neurons show this slowly increasing activity even before receiving reward. So this is teammates, and rats are starting from this point and then going to the left or right, depending on uh, the, the sound cue in this task, and receive reward at the uh, end of this T, okay? So, uh, rat starts from here, and then reach to a goal, either left or right, and then get the cue that indicates that we, uh, the rat is going to get reward or not. So this is the task, and in this kind of task, People observe that, uh, so this is the measurement of dopamine using uh, the method called cy cyclic voltammetry. This is uh, an electrochemical method, a really, uh, relatively um, old method now. now, now. Uh, but measure dopamine signals in the Rikasa Kimbax, the similar region that I described before. Now, you can see this slowly increasing dopamine signal. And in different tasks, this is a two and one task. So the two reward ports are associated with uh, different reward, uh, reward probabilities. And then rather chooses left or right depending on the probabilities. And if in this task, uh, so this is when the Q, uh, reward Q is presented for reward one unrewarded. Uh, but before receiving that Q, uh, there was a slow increase in dopamine. And this is also a measurement using cyclic voltammetry. So they propose that uh, these uh, in slowly increasing dopamine signals may be corresponding to value instead of your other prediction errors. Uh, and then this kind of value signals may be important for motivating animals. So how good or bad the situation is can motivate animals. So that's the idea that they propose. Now, uh, going back to the previous uh, schematic, uh, these slowly ramping dopamine signals may be actually booking this part of the value function. So the question became that do dopamine ramps represent reward prediction errors? Yeah. Sorry, before you go on, uh, I know this is not the point of the slide, but uh, is it weird that the unrewarded um, dopamine is so high there, like the classical theory would predict a dip there. And so for both experiments, um, I guess especially the one on the left is surprising. The one both is surprising, I, I was, I guess we have a little bit of a dip on the right, but um, the elevated dopamine unrewarded condition on the left is especially surprising. Yeah, so there could be a couple of reasons, and this is again very slow measurement, and then they have a big electrode in the brain, and they're measuring extracellular space. So without, so normally dopamine is pumped up uh, using uh, dopamine transporters from uh, uh, the extracellular space. And if you put a big electrode inside, that kind of pumping mechanism may be also in there. So you might not be seeing through deep uh, in this kind of thing. Okay, so uh, dopamine ramps may represent uh, value or questions. So let's step back and think about what might, what's happening in the standard model. 
And in particular, what's happening uh, uh, during the period uh, between the Q and the war, where uh, the TD error is at zero in this model. Okay. And TD error is zero, not because nothing is happening in this model. TD error is zero under certain circumstances. And let's unpack that, right? So TD error is again defined by these three terms, wrap reward, value of state, t plus one, and value of state t. Now, before receiving reward, uh, R of t is zero. So let's ignore that for, for, for this. And to make TD error zero, this part of the equation has to be zero. So let's imagine value of V of t uh, v of t plus one and v of t like here. Now, uh, what relationship that does it should uh, uh, this should hold? So, uh, to make this part of zero, v of t should be gamma times smaller than v of t plus one. Yeah. And this relationship should hold for all the time points. And what is this function? Yeah, exponential uh, function. So only if the value function is exponential function defined by gamma, does the TD error become zero, right? So uh, the, the, even the simple model, something intricate is happening during this period, okay? So only if this, Part of the, the curve or the, the value function is exponential function defined by corresponding to gamma. This this kind of factor, um, then uh, the TDR becomes zero. So there's some interesting processes happening here, right? At least in this model. Okay. Now, so after thinking about this, you can see that. Uh, so previously, people proposed that TD error must be flat, and then value function is increasing as the animal gets closer and closer to the reward location. So ramping dopamine signals has to be a value function. So that's the kind of the idea proposed. But if the value function is not actually exponential uh, defined by gamma, like more complex value function, or support whatever the reason is, then the TD error can ramp up, or positive, positive or even ramp up, right? So at least in theory, right, that if value function is a different function, TD error may look different, not, not, not flat. So just by observing ramping increasing dopamine, we cannot tell that whether we, we, we are looking at this value function or TD error, as a result of more complex body function. So then we stepped back and then thought that how can we really test whether uh, dopamine ramps are really TD error or a body function or something else, right? Uh, but we stepped back and thought that what are the essential properties of TD error in the first place? And we then went back to, uh, and, and then asked whether uh, do dopamine neurons have such properties? And what is the uh, properties that TD error should have? Which is uh, this derivative-like property. So when value changes, value increase or decrease, TD error should, uh, uh, should be positive or negative. So uh, the question then becomes that uh, whether the dopamine signals reflect the derivative value function or value function itself, right? So, so some function or derivative of it. So to test that, how can we uh, really design experiment? So conceptually, you can see that if some, there's some underlying uh, function and then whether it's that function or derivative, you, you can try to quickly change that, that function and then see whether the, uh, the, uh, your measurement really reflect the change uh, or the original function itself. So uh, what we try to do, so let's imagine that now 
or you can teleport a mouse uh, when uh, the mouse is uh, moving along this linear corridor, uh, getting closer and closer. And then you can quickly change the value. So the idea is, as the animal gets uh, closer and closer to the goal location, the value should be increasing. So one assumption here is, uh, as the animal gets closer and closer, there's some monotonic increase of value. But now we, we are not really uh, uh, married to particular shape or anything, right? Just let's assume that monotonically increasing function. Now, if you quickly teleport uh, from uh, one location to the uh, location closer to the 31 location, then value should quickly increase at the time of teleport. So you can just splice these two, two parts of the curves, and then uh, you have the step increase uh, followed by the original function here. Okay. So this is what value function should look like when we teleport. But if you uh, uh, if dopamine signals are actually T D error because it's derivative like, uh, you should see this tangent uh, response. So this uh, uh, so this kind of experiment uh, make completely different, qualitatively different predictions for value and T D error. So the question becomes how can we teleport, right? So this is not science fiction. Uh, but we can take advantage of virtual reality. So um, we can present a mouse with this virtual reality, and then uh, we can uh, quickly teleport from one location to the, to the other. So in this task, a uh, mouse is presented with, with this virtual reality stimulus. And then the reward is given at certain location. Uh, in this case, at the end of the corridor, uh, right here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So in this experiment, if you're constantly making the mouse teleport, uh, do you expect to also see like the warp in terms of the, the mouse finding itself in a different place than you expected? Oh yeah. yeah. So if you just repeat the same teleport uh, constantly or frequently the mouse might burn the teleport. So we try to keep the frequency of teleport uh, really, really uh, small. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So to do this experiment, as I said, uh, mice are here fixed, and then presented with comp three computer monitors to show this uh, virtual, uh, virtual scene, um, and measure dopamine signals from the ventral side, like on nuclear circumference. And so I'll show you several experiments. And one uh, experiment is uh, so there's a long teleport, short teleport, and just pausing at the particular location. And the value should predict this step right increase, and uh, real prediction error, TD error, should predict this a transient response. And the response magnitude should be bigger for long teleport compared to short teleport. What happens when you just stop the movement? Um, when you stop the movement, the scene is not moving, so the, there's no change in value. So uh, one prediction is, one, uh, one possibility is uh, just uh, T error goes to zero, right? There's no change. But the value should stay there. Um, and so the, uh, uh, so this is the result. So in the standard condition, we will actually edit, produce a ramping signal. So we can perform these experiments. Similar to spatial navigation uh, performed the, the, by the previous experiments where people observe the ramping. Now, now uh, this is a short teleport and long teleport. Uh, so we, we can see this uh, the, the transient response followed by some uh, reward response here. Okay. okay. And when uh, the scene was paused, the dopamine signals went down to uh, to the baseline. So, uh, so these uh, tangent responses look very much like this prediction, and then dopamine signals went down to baseline uh, as predicted from uh, this model. So, uh, so this experiment strongly supported this TD error RPE model. 
as opposed to the barrier. And what's important about the barrier uh, is that uh, just before receiving the here, right, the barrier should reach to the same uh, level, level because at that point, the mouse is about to get the same amount of reward. So, so the, the value should uh, converge uh, to the same location, but that's not what we see right here. So there's some um, a vari uh, violation of the prediction based on value as well. And one of the difficulties of studying and distinguishing value from TD era is that Value is something that you cannot directly measure or manipulate. And this value is arguably a subjective thing. Uh, so you cannot really directly at least control it, and you can see it. So we wanted to design some experiments to reveal at least some shape of value function using this technique. So what we did was to teleport at different location, but the same distance. Right? And if there is a convex value function, then the TD error should uh, be, become bigger and bigger as the teleport happens at, at closer and closer location. Right? And this would support at least convex uh, shape of value function. And that's actually what we saw. So uh, when teleport happens closer to the reward location, we see huge uh, dopamine response. But if teleport happens far away, not so much. So this at least reveals, under this assumption, that there is a uh, uh, convex value function. But it appears at the very beginning, we still see a large response. Yeah, right? yeah. Even if the slope should be very close to zero. Well, I guess this, maybe this, this, uh, this schematic was wrong, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so just to clarify, the animal was trained below the, 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 the distance of the oh. objective, right? Yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah, that's an assumption. But uh, we can tell that at least animal get very close to the reward location, they start to uh, leak the water source. So at least they know uh, when it's close enough. Any other questions? Yeah. Why, why, do you, why do you think it would be the case that the value function of the animal is different from the exponential thing? Because I, I, I would assume that if you learn by TD learning, eventually it should yeah. be the real thing. I will come back to that if I have time. <laughs> so, well, I guess the plan is uh, I might not be able to finish this, this experiment, but I, I will have uh, the second talk in the afternoon. So I will continue a little bit and then talk about different things. Anyway, I, I will come back to that. So if I don't, please remind me. OK, so another important uh, experiment is um, changing speed of uh, the scene movement, just, just my, uh, changing the speed of the scene movement. And uh, what's interesting is, in this experiment, the value, uh, so, sorry, the, if dopamine signals are temporal difference error, it's derivative. If it's temporal derivative, then uh, it should uh, scale, the ramp itself should scale. So this is experiment test where the ramp itself has this derivative-like property. And um, indeed, that's the case. So the fast movement, slow movement, the ramp, ramp slope uh, itself uh, changes. So ramp itself has this uh, 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 derivative-like property, not just tangent responses. And more yeah. So, why different for zero, there is a significant difference between the three conditions, the two conditions? Uh, black and. Uh, why before zero, there is a significant difference between the slow and slow? Oh, here. Yeah, the black one. I'm uh, not sure. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, more extreme exam example is this. So, uh, so this is another, uh, again, this linear track moving from this location to that location. We kept the total duration of each trial the same, but the profile of the speed is different. So in this case, fast movement followed by slow movement. And so this is y axis position. So fast movements followed by slow movement. And this one, slow movement 
followed by a fast move. So just change the uh, profile of the speed. So at the starting point, expectation about reward is the same because uh, the trial duration is the same, right? But just the, uh, the velocity profiles are different. And what's interesting is uh, the prediction for reward prediction error is that uh, it goes up and down corresponding to the speed of the movement. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, the speed of the movement. And slow, uh, the going slow, and then up for fast, slow to fast. And what's interesting is the endpoints should be very different, as opposed to when the, uh, if it's value, it should converge to the same uh, point because yeah, the same reason that I mentioned. Yeah. Just about what you're saying before. Here we have discrete states. Mm -hmm. There is some parameter in my TV learning. Yeah. So this orders, this orders shows that this parameter is not changing. So that's correct because if it were changing, then I could. Yeah, these curves could I could expect them to be anything, right? So the so TAR can be defined for continuous um, uh, value, about continuous time. So um, I, I think this characterization could be kind of the convenience or approximation of what what might be happening. But sorry, sorry, but what what what, is, what I think. Should, if you do define it for continuous time, wouldn't you have a time scale, like a tau? Yeah. And I'm saying if this tau is, you assume that it's not changing, then you would have that. But if this tau were changing between conditions, um, then these curves could be different from... Yeah, yeah. okay, so uh, these trials are interdict. So the assumption is these basic parameters are shared. <laughs> Uh, there's a possibility that the brain might adapt to different conditions. Yes. Taking the derivative position without uh, looking at the value, give the same type of patterns for these. Uh, what to see on the right-hand plot? Yes. If we just would have taken the derivative of the position, not the value, would have seen a, a similar pattern. Oh, uh, derivative of. So yeah, I, I think uh, yeah. So, so you just get uh, multiply by some nonlinear uh, function, and then you you can transform it between value and position. Yeah. Yeah. So is this the calculation that you have assumed that the, does the calculation of the value function assume that animal at a certain point? will assume that he'll move at current speed to the goal. That's the basic assumption here, right? Or not. I just want to clarify that. So can, can you say yes? So, so for, for example, I'm the animal and I'm at a certain point and I'm moving at a certain speed. Yeah. And uh, the calculation of the value function is assuming that oh. I think I will move at current speed all the way to the oh, Is that the assumption underlying this calculation so, or no? The way this is computed is based on instantaneous uh, speed. So it, it, it's not taking into account future, uh, future profile speed. Only the current profile. Right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, um, so value is just uh, the location, the function location. So I just want to clarify your question again. So uh, what she said again, but your answer applies to both the value um, model and the RPM model, or only to the value model? Only the value model, right? Uh, so this RP is based on instantaneous uh, changing value. So, so we start from some value function as a function of time, and then uh, we compute uh, a v, gamma v of t, t plus one minus v of t. That, that's how this was done. And then there's another way to compute value, like proposed, like we take into account uh, the time to, to reward. Uh, that, that's in the paper, but that's not shown here. I have a following up question. Yeah. So, if 
like a, a animal a discount value exactly at the experimental way, then the standard condition they move constantly. Shouldn't RPV be zero? Yeah, so that's another, so that, so that the same question as before, and yeah. I will come back later why that happens. Okay. Yeah, at this point, we are not really solving the issue of why value function might be more complex. Yeah. Yeah, but the data is consistent with that. Yeah. But I will try to explain that. So, so this is the, the data. Uh, and uh, if you saw, see, uh, this yellow curve and uh, red curve uh, uh, end at different point, and then rapidly corresponds to this speed of profile, okay. or data value by TD, TDC, TD. Okay. So this is very different from what you predict from value, so, um, but consistent with TDL. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> This is varying the projection to the mental yeah. what, 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 what topic response the kind of uh, your heterogeneity and other projection and other like a uh, 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 substantial like well, cross compare that? Yeah, we have not done that experiment yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, one possibility is that so when you have teleport or fast movement, maybe arousal level might change or attention level might change. So it could be some reflecting some sensory surprise, right? So that's a valid uh, question. So to address that, we uh, prepared two linear tracks and then teleport it uh, between the tracks, but keeping the relative position the same. The idea is the surprise people are being teleported, but the value should not change. Yeah. In this condition, we don't see uh, dopamine response. But with the same animal, if we do take four out teleport, again, close up to the reward location, we do see this transient response, very big response, right? So um, as long as we do not change the value, uh, dopamine neurons don't seem to respond. Another um, experiment that I use against sensor, sensory surprise is we also did this backward teleport. So backward teleport also could be surprising, uh, but uh, it changes the value in negativity. So you would predict that uh, the TDR should go down, and that's what we actually observe. So instead of positive response, we see this negative response. So uh, this again consistent with TD error, but inconsistent with sensory surprise idea. Okay. Yeah. All right. So there was some controversy in the field that so these ramping dopamine signals may be specific to dopamine release uh, in, in the axon, but not cerebrally. So that was proposed by Josh Brooks. But, um, so we wanted to address that by recording a uh, spiking activity of individual dopamine neurons. Uh, so previous measurement just measured uh, bulk calcium or uh, dopamine signals in the humans. Now we are looking at single dopamine neuron activity. To do that, uh, we use the technique called opto-tagging or uh, optogenetic identification, meaning that we express light-activatable channel of uh, um, channel production in dopamine neurons. And then we record activity of uh, neurons like this. So we get spikes uh, from a single neuron. And if we shine a light, and we can see light evolved spikes. And that, that, that way we can tell that the neurons that we are recording is coming from uh, dopamine neurons. We can also label different types of neurons to record from different types of neurons. But in this case, in this experiment, we recorded from dopamine neurons sampled across wide area of the ventral tegment area, BTA. So we see, so this is a single example neuron. Uh, so this is a RASA plot, uh, other than many triangles. Uh, we see, so just to guide your eye, there's slight increase uh, before receiving the word. And um, you might wonder, this might, might not be as prominent as 
uh, the, the calcium or dopamine signals that uh, I presented. But uh, if you just convolve these signals with slow current corresponding to slow measurement, uh, we touched on that before, we can actually recover this very strong um, drama. And also this transient component is decreased, just numbing all of these sharp responses. But what's important is that more, many of many uh, recent studies uh, pointing out these ramping signals come from this slow measurement. Uh, it particularly cyclic photometry and calcium imaging dopamine measurement. So the prominence of uh, uh, ramping signals is in part because of the slowness of the measurement. Uh, it's just, uh, uh, yeah, this is something to keep in mind talking about spiking activity and these slow measurement signals. Yeah. But so now we have simply on, yeah? Uh, emerging from uh, emerging from the uh, calcium um, measurement is because of the uh, uh, later uh, uh, high s s s signal is affecting the previous signal, right? So if you have a slow kernel, then the the, the later part of the high signal will affect the previous signal, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're just summing up the all the time and the row. You're not using an a causal kernel, right? It's not looking ahead in time. Right. Yeah. So now we have measurement from single neuron, so we can really look at at the single neuron level what's happening. So these are the concatenated traces from standard condition, long shot, teleport, pause speed migration and so on. And just pay attention, please pay attention to this. So if you look at so these are about uh, 80 or 90 neurons that we recorded, 80. And then uh, if you look at single neurons, almost all of them have transient response at the time of teleport. Right? So uh, this derivative like property seems to be a very common property across many dopamine neurons. Yeah. Now, to quantify this, uh, we use so-called fractional derivative. So the derivative is usually defined for integer values, but you can extend that definition to uh, non-integer uh, orders of uh, derivative. And so we start from some monotonically increasing value function, uh, for example, exponential value function, and then compute different fractional derivatives uh, based on uh, this different orders of bank, uh, orders of derivative, and ask which order of derivative best fit the data that we obtain. So uh, using this, uh, the axonal calcium signals that we measured from the ventral side and, uh, we, uh, so these are uh, in individual uh, animals, but each dot is individual animals in this case, and then uh, we, we get uh, on average uh, around one. So the first order derivative uh, approach makes the dopamine signal. This is also the case for uh, the single neuron activity. Uh, and there are some dopamine neurons that show uh, this value, the activity more consistent with value. Like that. So zero order of derivative is just original function, so exponential value, uh, exponential uh, function. So two, two neurons. Uh, Show that uh, actually, so this postdoc uh, Asar Mani ob obtained these two neurons relatively early, and so he got so excited. So that, well, now we have value-related dopamine uh, neurons, and then uh, after uh, getting that, uh, he kept looking for these value-related neurons, and then kept failing and failing and failing, and then. Eventually, he recorded uh, from more than 100 neurons, which is a kind of record. Uh, so most of them turned out to be one uh, or slightly larger than one uh, in terms of order of, man, uh, order of data. So at even at single neuron level, uh, the data is consistent with uh, this derivative idea. Now, um, yeah? So I, I think the error is, 
is different from the first order yeah. of the derivative because there is a gamma term there. So yeah. Yeah. Um, how, how can I explain this? Yeah, so, um, yeah, that, that's interesting, right? So, uh, the derivative, fractional derivative might look like this. Um, and the TDR uh, could be actually like this. So it's not completely the state. It is different. They are different. Yes. So this is um, fractional So yeah, it is different. But I think this analysis is constrained by uh, by the uh, freedom of this function. Right? So we, we assume that this is described by different orders of derivative. The result turned out to be one, or slightly larger one. And the fact that it's slightly larger than one is, I think, reflecting the presence of this one. So if, if it's first order derivative, you would get this. But there seems to be some overshoot, which is kind of similar to this one. Right? So I think this is just a speculation, but uh, it's not a completely first order derivative. But if there's an overshoot, and then coming back. Uh, and, and that's kind of the, the direction that you would see for uh, for the for the T T. Oh, okay, so, so sorry, I didn't think this, but wait, so if you have value function that is like this, uh, you will get fractional derivative slightly larger than one, uh, and then T T is going to be like this. Good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If it's completely flat um, square function. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so let, let me summarize this part. So wrapping as well as basic domain signals can be approximated by the fast order derivative of some function. And the magnitude of dopamine signals was scaled by size of reward. So this is something that I didn't show, but if you have larger reward, run, and as well as transient response could be bigger. So it's scaled, the signals are scaled by how good the actual reward is going to be. And dopamine neurons did not respond to pure surprise, uh, sensory surprises. So just let's ignore the TD uh, that you, you've already known. But just by based on the data that we obtained, we can pretty much say that dopamine signals contain reward and then something like fast order derivative, close to fast order derivative. This is a very good evidence already that the dopamine is like uh, this TD error. Right? So even without knowing TD equation, you can derive this basic property from this experiment. So the reason for that is based on the alternative hypothesis, we try to maximize the difference, right? So the previous experimental paradigms are not optimized to dissociate these two possibilities. So we design experiments to maximize the difference between two possibilities, teleport or speed migrations. And after doing that, the result is really obvious that it's more close to TDR instead of the body. Uh, so uh, it, this highlights the idea of uh, theory-driven experiments. So if you have different hypotheses, try to maximize the difference uh, by designing an experiment. And then that will give you stronger uh, uh, inference. OK. So coming back to the point of uh, TD learning, I pointed out that the TD learning, sorry, uh, reinforcement learning is generally difficult because the reward is delayed. And then TD learning solves this by computing uh, the change in value moment by moment basis. And then uh, learning value or action value based on such signal. So uh, the key to success of TD learning is computing a TD error on a moment by moment basis. And our experiments really show, demonstrate that TD uh, dopamine signals does that, do, do that, right? So 
Um, yeah. So, uh, yes, yeah. that, 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 that's it for this lecture. Thank you so much for So while, uh, while mouse runs the treadmill, its velocity probably changes from time to time. So when uh, it's supposed to compute its expected value, something like that we take into account that it has some variance in the speed. Uh -huh. yeah. And, and, yeah, and how does this influence at conclusion? Uh, so if you change overall speed uh, of the experiment, then uh, the dopamine signals might adapt. Uh, we have not. So you mean the the mouse never runs the continuous itself? Oh. Always the new movement. Yeah, right. Oh, I see. Yeah. So in, uh, okay. Okay. So in the experiments that we presented, the mouse was uh, passively presented uh, by moving scene. Uh, uncoupled with the motion of the, of the mass. Yeah, but uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, the speed it runs it. Like, they still need to run it itself, right? Yeah, uh, it doesn't have to in this paradigm, but okay. we also think a closer loop version of it so that uh, the same movement. Oh, okay, so, so it totally passively. Yeah, the, in, in the, the data that I presented is done in that way. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, but we, we, even if we do cross the loop condition, we see qualitatively similar uh, response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also did teleport in these cross the loop conditions as well. Oh, uh, a related question. And how does its computation of value um, influenced by its uh, like simultaneous exposure to several different conditions? Like sometimes it's teleported, and sometimes it's not. Yeah. Yeah, how, how does this influence its expectation? So we try not to overtrain with these manipulations. So there's always standard conditions that runs together with uh, teleportation conditions. So it's like the log design? Uh, no, randomly interleaved. Yeah, yeah, but that means it has kind of this trial, this condition, next trial, different condition. Yes. Then when it has expectations, it may like yeah. take into account yeah, several trials or even a longer history. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have not done overtraining with uh, teleport or uh, some other condition, right? So if you just keep doing teleportation, uh, uh, animal will learn uh, the, the presence of teleportation in that case. Teleportation is not no longer surprising, so the response might go down, and then uh, the response might propagate to earlier time point. That that's what uh, theory would predict. Yeah, but we have not done the experiment. Uh, thank you. With re respect to the uh, the velocity thing, I think that uh, there might be one one figure to draw is that. Uh, you replace the horizontal axis of the uh, token signal from time to location to, to the position, then you can uh, like uh, uh, remove the effect of time. So, so you can verify whether the token neuron, the, the signal is affected by uh, on a time basis or on a position basis. Yeah, actually, this experiment already. It's pointing to uh, time, time instead of the position. Uh, uh, but this may be because uh, the mice are overtrained in this particular condition. So for position and time are uh, kind of uh, uh, So my mice are trained in a condition where time and position are highly correlated. So uh, yeah, but the dopamine signals seems to be picking up more time-based computation rather than question-based computation. Yeah, because I'm curious about uh, whether the uh, TD error is calculated by a, uh, on a time basis or on a position basis, like the VT plus 1 minus VT or VS plus 1 minus VS. Yes. Uh, I think this data is more concerned with time data rather than spatial data.
I want to ask more biological question. So, do, so first of all, you're looking at the nucleus accumbens, right? So, does those cells also get get projection from the substantial nigra or compacta? Uh, nucleus accumbens is mostly uh, from BTA. Substantial nigra project the more dorsal part of the strata. So, so they are segregated. Okay. So if I if we want to look at the dorsal part of the stratum, is this is the signal that we get from the compacta similar to the signal that we're getting from the VTA in terms of the, the value of this signal? Yeah, we have not done, done that experiment. I think okay. uh, yeah, he, the, the post of Kim Kim left the lab and then he might be doing it, so we try not to open it. This is also a lot of there's the three. Yeah, yeah, it is very interesting question. Yeah. Yes, okay. Yes. Yeah, I've seen it in uh, Richard. Uh, so I have a question regarding the other um, the possible contributions to dopamine uh, related uh, uh, signals, such as uh, uh, here you don't have any evidence for surprise, uh, sensory surprise. Um, so one possibility could be like the, so there is a surprise also when the animal transition from one trial to another trial. So when you teleport backwards, there is a positive surprise for the transportation, but there is a negative surprise in the sense that, oh man, in the future I have to wait a little bit longer to, uh, to, to transition to the new yeah. trial. So these two things make counterbalance. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know your opinion on this. And the second related question is there is some evidence now that uh, Spontaneous movements, the mm -hmm. uh, this kind of is kind of elicit uh, yeah. some surprising events, kind yeah. of elicit uh, dopamine release. So, yeah. how do you put all these things together with your theory? Yeah, yeah, so that's a great question. I don't have a complete answer, but in the ventral cerebellum, generally, we don't see much uh, movement related activities. Uh, movement activity seems to be more prominent in those of cerebellum. Uh, and also, something like uh, Loud sound, like just playing big sensory stimuli, and that, that must be surprising. We don't see much response in the ventral side. Rather, uh, loud sound might cause a negative response because it's uh, startling. Uh, so, uh, yeah, fear level, like that. So, uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, so the, uh, the backward teleport could have surprise and also negative value modulation, and it seems at least the negative value modulation dominates uh, in that condition. We don't have any evidence for sensory surprise. Uh, I just want to add one thing because I'm also working with straight. Uh, so uh, as I understand, the nucleus accumbens is only like uh, found in the tail of the stratum, which is very, very steer part and very ventral. But if you go to more interior parts, mm -hmm. I, uh, even like uh, ventral parts that are just interested for like mouth movements or licking, mm -hmm. uh, they still get the inputs from the compacta mostly, not PTA, mm -hmm. but it's more anterior parts. Just like. Uh, well, I guess my understanding is the terminal striatum is very posterior, mm -hmm. and then Akimban uh, Soviet recording is relatively more anterior. Uh, and then the leaking related areas could be more ventral lateral and slightly more posterior than the Kim Bums. Uh, so, but still, that area, well, I guess ventral lateral slide that might receive some inputs from the Kim Bums. Um, yeah. Okay. But I, I wonder, like, what happens when, when the mouse wants to do, like, a complex paper in order to get rewarded? Yeah. So it's not only yeah. like one way for you he, he, we also like he also used the dorsal and the ventral striatum to do one way here. Yeah. Which is rewarded for him. Yeah. So I I don't think we really understand how that works, but the one way uh, that is commonly proposed is ventral striatum might be more Pavlovian related, meaning the association is more between stimulus and outcome. Uh, so not necessarily stimulus to action. So uh, the ventral striatum um, may, may be inducing uh, some activation in the hypothalamus uh, these areas to kind of induce reward-related response. But that could be decided by some other parts of the brain. So yeah, but I, we, I, I don't think we 
really understand how this works. And the dosal slide and maybe more stimulus action or state action based um, action regulation, but the ventral slide and maybe more uh, stimulus outcome related association. But, uh, but yeah, it, does that sound okay, Natanya? Or? <laughs> yeah. He's the expert. So the someone tried to, like all of these data, try to probe the RPE in the dopamine arm, but did someone tried to probe the actual value in the striatum neuron? Oh, yeah, so yeah, we are trying to do that, but not necessarily these paradigms, but yeah, we, we are doing that. Is it harder? Why like, most labs targeting the, the dopamine part and not the value part? Yeah, yeah, I wish other people they go from other ones, but uh, so, so, so the thing is, value of representation is all, all over the brain. So the value signals are observed in many other brains. So, uh, but including the ventral side. So there's evidence that uh, ventral side and neurons encode value. Uh, it's, just, it's just that we, we don't know how they behave in these paradigms. Uh, yeah, it would be great to uh, do that. And, uh, Let's take a five minutes, something break, and then we...